minutes after 10 is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, for which I thank you. Um, quite a lot to get through today, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say. I'm drawn to these stories, or the story, regarding the, the relaunch of the attempt to somehow regulate online pornography, to, to, to introduce some sort of age limit. And I, I worry a little that, not for the first time, I got a bit distracted by the red herring or by the wrong bit of the story like well how hard is it going to be to introduce the technology whereas really the question i think should be how important is this legislation and I, i'll be asking mothers i think later in the program how you feel your son's attitude to uh, sex and associated matters women in particular has been affected by this proliferation of pornography that anybody um uh, of my generation finds almost impossible to contemplate existing when we were you know, getting excited about your mate's dad's dirty magazine being found in the back of the garden shed or something like that. So I, I am intrigued by that, but I'm also conscious of how ignorant I am of a lot of the issues. I, I, I want to return to the question of housing purchases as well, although poor old Kirsty Allsop has been taking a bit of a kicking from all corners on that one. There, there is, though, um, a major problem with the continuing perception that the reason why young people can't get on the property ladder, and not just young people anymore, of course, that age goes up, uh, is, is because they spend all their time on holiday or uh, watching Netflix. I don't think at this point in the programme we will be talking about the West Ham footballer, and regular listeners will know, I bear no uh, warm will towards West Ham United at the moment. They, they, they broke my heart twice on Saturday in the most astonishing of circumstances. But at the moment, I'm not planning on having a conversation about a footballer kicking a cat, or, except to mention that Rupert Murdoch's Sun newspaper considers it to be the most important story of the day. But I reserve the right to be wrong and to, and to, to wade into that uh, epic saga a little later in the programme. I, I'm going to begin, though, with this Keir Starmer story. And the question I am going to ask you, very simply, is this. Is the Prime Minister responsible for the attacks upon Keir Starmer and his colleagues yesterday? And the answer is obviously yes, but only in part. And the reason I would say that to you is because the element of the abuse and attack directed at the leader of the opposition that focused directly and was spawned directly from Boris Johnson's lie in the House of Commons, which he has attempted, obviously, to um, sort of retreat from without admitting that he lied in the first place, only formed a small part of the abuse directed at the leader of the opposition. And these people would have been there anyway. I've, I've had the misfortune... I say misfortune. I mean, it can be quite amusing, but there's always that worry in the back of your mind that this, this, this one might be the real wrong one. I, I've had the misfortune of encountering these mobs myself on occasion. I told you the story. I, I was sort of almost like a Wimbledon um, uh, viewer, a Wimbledon spectator, with a, a fellow on one side accusing me of being a massive racist because I'd blocked him on Twitter, and a fellow on the other side accusing me of supporting a, a satanic paedophile plot because I was in favour of the coronavirus vaccine. I kid you not, and, and they were deadly serious, and they both put cameras in your face. I'm told they make their money from these so-called live streams on YouTube, and, and I can still, you can hear it in my voice, I still snigger at these people. I still find myself, I, I still find them completely ridiculous, but then one wonders, I wonder how many people have not got themselves vaccinated because of watching these idiots on YouTube. I wonder how many people have genuinely persuaded themselves that there's a satanic paedophile conspiracy. And I'm afraid at this point, the parallels with QAnon and with American politics that a caller to this programme raised last week are impossible to refute or resist. You simply can't do it. You know, the idea that Keir Starmer is, is part of some conspiracy to protect paedophiles like Jimmy Savile, which was the clear... Uh, accusation being levelled at him yesterday is born of exactly the same uh, toxic, bonkers rhetoric that spawned the whole QAnon movement. And I, I, I think Boris Johnson knew exactly what he was doing when he threw it into the mix. And I now have even more sympathy for the non-mad elements of the American media than I had when they were trying to cover Donald Trump's lies. Because what do you do? Boris Johnson is Prime Minister. You can't ignore what he says. Donald Trump was president. He claimed the election was stolen from him. How do you cover someone who is prepared to go to places that our civilization is not equipped to accommodate? 
Our civilization is equipped to accommodate dangerous liars on YouTube. We've seen the damage that they can do on Facebook, but our societies, our political frameworks are not structured in a way that can accommodate the men at the very top of the pyramid engaging in the sort of dangerous lies that you would expect from Piers Corbyn or uh, some bloke on Fox News. I mean, it's bad enough that some bloke on Fox News and Piers Corbyn get any form of public platform, but that's the price you pay for freedom of expression. What we are not equipped to do is cope with calumny from the top. All politicians are lies, yes, but there are lies and there are lies. There are opinions that turn out to be wrong, there are predictions that turn out to be false, and then there are barefaced lies. There are deliberate and obvious lies. I thought I was at a work gathering when in fact I was at a party. And then I wasn't accusing Keir Starmer of failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile when I accused Keir Starmer of failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. Here's the transcript. Here are the worlds of him doing it. Here's him claiming that he didn't. And it creates something that is terrifying. And people will be falling for it. And I'm sorry, I know this upsets you sometimes, but not everybody who falls for it deserves to be attacked. Not everybody who falls for it should prompt disgust. In your mind, a lot of these people mean well. And they really believe the crud that they're being fed. You couldn't expect me to make an observation about that without mentioning Brexit. And on this side of the Atlantic, that's where so much of this flows from. So much of it flows from there. Believing things that aren't true and then being forced by a combination of politics and personality to double down and treble down and quadruple down in support and in defence of things that you now know not to be true, or things that perhaps you knew all along would not be true. And I think he did it on purpose. And if he did it on purpose, then he bears responsibility for much of what happened to Keir Starmer yesterday, but not all of it, because the people would have been there already, and the nonsense about vaccines or satanic paedophile conspiracies or Julian Assange would have been spouted anyway. So what do you think? Was the uh, mob that abused and sought to attack Keir Starmer yesterday caused by the Prime Minister's lie in the House of Commons? Was it, is it fair to say that Boris Johnson bears at least some personal responsibility for what happened to the leader of the opposition on the streets outside Scotland Yard? And I think now I know how America happened, how people were queuing up even on this side of the Atlantic to claim that there were legitimate concerns about the election result, to claim that Donald Trump really had been a victim of some sort of con undertaken by I, I God knows who, people uh, who had the power to uh, steal an, ele an election from an American president. I, the, the, it, you just have to switch your brain off, don't you? You have to switch your brain off and, and wave your flag a little harder and stop thinking about things. And even intelligent people can do that. We saw it here. People in the British media, people, I think even on this radio station, uh, buying into the absolute nonsense that the American election had in some way um, been conducted dishonestly or that Donald Trump had been in some way robbed of his rightful results. It's, it's mad and it's bitten America on the backside now because one thing Donald Trump could probably claim credit for was, was the speed of the vaccine production. And of course his rump, his base, his QAnon-inspired followers have now been persuaded that the vaccine is evil and they're dying in droves having not taken it. So it, it, there are no winners when you normalise lies. You have short-term winners. And, and, of course, you know, the big man might be a winner in a way. Trump could be president again. Boris Johnson remains prime minister. But the injection of, of uncontrollable, uncontested, unprecedented lies into the political bloodstream of both countries is a hell of a lot more serious than most people realise, including most people in my business. Because it, it's so abnormal now that you can't quite accept it. I suffer from it myself. Sometimes you notice it, right, on the radio, when I start doing a spiel like this, and halfway through it, I, I, I go, oh, my days. Just listen to those words again. This is what we've become. Whether it's Nadine Dorries claiming that she's somehow uh, uh, the person to clean up 
the internet when she's responsible for the most vile of abuse directed at completely blameless people, including some of Britain's best-loved broadcasters. The minister whose brief includes misinformation. Think about this. Bloke called Chris Philp, who was doing the studio rounds today. His brief includes misinformation. What Boris Johnson said about Keir Starmer in the House of Commons was misinformation. Boris Johnson's entire regime is built upon misinformation. And he is reduced in public to defending it. And you can't defend a liar without lying. So here it is. Here is Chris Philp, uh, a, a Minister for Technology with responsibility for misinformation. And I don't know that I'd normally do this. And it, it is certainly not something I'd point out regarding an amateur. Um, and, and I haven't double-checked this particular clip, but I heard him being interviewed in a couple of places this morning. This is him talking to Nick Ferrari earlier. Uh, I, and it, you could almost hear the dry mouth that, that comes in when you're adrenalised, when you're in a sort of fight-or-flight scenario. And he will be in a fight-or-flight scenario because he's thinking, well, I can't lie, but I can't call the Prime Minister a liar. How the hell am I going to be able to walk this tightrope between defending a Prime Minister who I know to be a liar but not actually repeating the line, my, oh, man alive. So here is the sound of a government minister tying himself in knots. Would you have made those sort of comments to Sakir? Um, look, I think that's a matter of uh, individual um, and that's why choice I asked you. Would you have people. made those um, comments? Look, I mean... Uh, I, I wasn't. I think until you stand in someone else's shoes, you shouldn't um, sort of speculate about what you may or may not. But you must say, know whether you, know, you would have made the difficult comments and such stressful as that. Um, sure. situation. Well, I, I'm not sure I would have made them in that context. But I think the, the comments were uh, drawing attention to someone's general track record in public office is a right. kind of reasonable thing to do. It isn't. You can hear the swallow there. Play it again, Keith, and just listen right at the end for the swallow before the big lie comes. Would you have made those sort of comments to Sakir? Um, look, I think that's a matter of uh, individual um, and that's why choice I asked you. Would you for have people. Made those um, comments? Look, I mean, I, I wasn't. I think until you stand in someone else's shoes, you shouldn't um, sort of speculate about what you may or may not. But you must say, know whether you, know, you would have made the difficult comments and such stressful as that. Um, sure. situation. Well, I, I'm not sure I would have made them in that context, but I think the, the comments were uh, drawing attention to someone's general track record in public office is a right. kind of reasonable thing to do. Did you get it right at the end there? I think the attention in public office is a reasonable thing to do. Ah, no sympathy for him. None at all. None whatsoever. Some sympathy for the MPs calling publicly for this particular... And I told you at the time, this is pivotal. This is the, the, this is the moment that the parallels with Trump become irresistible. This is why his own advisers told him not to do it. This is why they've been resigning in their droves since he... Did it. Remember Manira Mirza? We were talking about her last week. This was the straw that broke that camel's back. And it's gross. And I'm sorry, but I don't know what the question is that I can ask you at 16 minutes after 10 on a Tuesday morning that will drive home the severity and the seriousness of this situation. All I can tell you is that when Donald Trump went down the same path, it ended with an armed mob attacking the equivalent of our parliament, baying for the blood of the vice president. Here, in the foothills of a similar mountain of, of awfulness, we have an unarmed mob baying for the head of the leader of the opposition and accusing him of all manner of things, some of which sprang fully formed from the lies of an elected prime minister. This is the mother of all parliaments. This country is the mother of all parliaments. It's a little bit self-congratulatory and it may not stand up to rigorous historic scrutiny, but it's something of which we are proud, should be proud, and soon won't be able to be proud if parliament becomes a place where toxic, divisive, dangerous and insightful lies go not only unpunished, but in the case of Chris Philp and others, Kwasi Kwarteng, Nadine Dorries, Liz Truss, they are actually defended. Think about that for a minute. Then think about January the 6th in America last year, and then think about what's at stake. 21 minutes after 10. Here is the uh, role of honour, and I mean that. I, I don't imagine I agree with many of these people on, on everything, or, or even perhaps on much. But cometh the hour, cometh the men, and as far as I can tell... Oh, no, and come with the men and Caroline Noakes, MP. These are the ten Tories I can identify who have correctly condemned 
Boris Johnson's foul lies, which led at least in part to that mob harassing and haranguing the leader of Her Majesty's opposition, Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, yesterday. We'll begin with Julian Smith, who's a former chief whip in the Conservative Party. He said, what happened to Keir Starmer tonight outside Parliament is appalling. It is really important for our democracy and for his security that the false Savile slurs made against him are withdrawn in full. I'll say that again. Former Conservative chief whip. Aaron Bell MP um, responded, Julian is right. Uh, he came in the 2019 intake, as did Robert Largan, who tweeted, I agree with Julian. Stephen Hammond, you remember him, formerly a big ally of Boris Johnson, replied, I agree with you, Robert. David Davis, again, not somebody I often have warm words to say, but today, not for the first time, he has done the right thing, telling a, 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 a fringe television station, Starmer is not guilty of anything with respect to Jimmy Savile, and that the PM should retract his comments and apologise. Roger Gale, I think, one of the people that gets described as a grandee, said that the events last night were a, quote, direct result of the deliberately careless use of language in the chamber. Tobias Elwood uh, said the Prime Minister, PM, apologise, please. Anthony Mangnall, uh, who has submitted his letter, as has Elwood, um, as has Roger Gale, actually, we must do better, which means leading by example in Westminster. And Simon Hoare, who uh, was one of the first to break cover, really, in criticism of Johnson's increasing uh, awfulness, retweeted Julian Smith's original tweet. Um, and Caroline Noakes has now been added to that list, making it 10 Tory MPs who have done the right thing over the Starmer incident. Um, she says, reminded of a Michael Deacon sketch from September 2019, language has consequences. Yesterday's hideous scenes outside Parliament serving as an urgent reminder that what is said inside the building reverberates outside. Let's do that again to give credit where credit is due. Julian Smith, Aaron Bell, Robert Largan, Stephen Hammond, David Davis, Roger Gale, Tobias Elwood, Anthony Mangnall, Simon Hoare and Caroline Noakes. Thank you. 23 minutes after 10, do you hold Boris Johnson responsible for what happened to Sir Keir Starmer last night? Susan Whitstable. Sue, what would you like to say? Yeah, good morning, James. How Thanks for having me on the show. Um... Yes, I most definitely hold Boris Johnson responsible um, for inciting violence against Keir Starmer. It, you know, we, we've got a society that's going um, like Trump's America. But what I particularly like to say is that this morning, the Telegraph, the Mail, the Sun did not think it fit to cover the leader of the opposition being mobbed violently as a result of Johnson's comments on their front covers. Um, they didn't think that newsworthy. Well, no, nor did the mirror. Yes, the mirror, mirror has. No, on my, oh, no, it has, you're right. Are you sure? Well, I, know, I mean, let's double check. The Telegraph, the, the, telegraph, the Mail and the Sun are not even covering it on their front pages. No, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's not normally I get schooled on the uh, excesses and, and absurdities of the right-wing newspapers, but you're right, unless we've all just only had early editions and they... Corrected yeah, the right. record later. They, you're right. It is... It, it, yeah, you're, you're, you're simply right. And yet Conservative MPs are queuing up. Can we call 10 a queue? I think we can. This is Britain, after all. Two peoples are queuing in this country. They're queuing up to, uh, to condemn him. It, it, this is the problem, isn't it, Sue? Because complicity... Silence becomes complicity now. So even by not reporting it prominently enough for you... They do report it, I'm sure. I'll double-check in a minute, but it must be inside the newspapers... They, the, 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 they, 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 they minimise the seriousness and the severity of the situation, which gives succour to the supporters of the lie. I, th I think it's beyond that with the likes of the Daily Mail. I think they are literally covering up Johnson's worst excesses to con their readership, sadly, and I saw them con my own mother year in, year out. Mm. They are conning their readership into believing that Johnson is not the low life he is. Why? So they're not even mentioning this. I, they must have mentioned page. it. No, you, oh, this isn't... Page. Oh, all right, you keep saying on the front page. I, I, you put me in the position of having to defend the Daily Mail. I shall ban you from this programme <laughs> for life. But I'm, I'm 99. I mean, of course it will be inside the paper. But, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, you put the biggest story on the front page and the order came in from America last night to the editor of The Sun that we want the story about the footballer kicking the cat on the front page. Yeah. Instead yeah, of the, instead of the irony, potentially there, violent the mob attack. attacking the leader of Her Majesty's opposition... Oh, it's dear. almost as if they're laughing at us, really. They could be. So. It's certainly not I suppose, what you might call a sufficient, sufficient level of severity. Thank you, Sue. Great point. 
It's great, that, isn't it? I, I forget to do the round of the right-wing newspapers and Sue pops up first caller and does it for me. The problem, of course, for the media, and I, I won't overburden you with these concerns because I get paid to, to deal with them, um, is that originally we're not going to talk about it, not going to mention it on the programme. And then, of course, it assumes a life of its own. And if you are interested in the truth, you then have to start talking about it because otherwise the lies go unchallenged. And, you know, the best case scenario is no lies, but a challenged lie is better than an unchallenged lie. And therefore, you have to start talking about it. And then when you start talking about it, even though you are telling the truth, even though you are supporting and defending the truth, you add to the to the general noise surrounding an issue that isn't true. And I hate this, and I hope I'm wrong, but it's very hard not to worry that simply by adding to the general noise surrounding an issue that isn't true, the issue gains more traction and ends up wrongly understood in the minds of people who've heard. I hope not. I mean, I don't really understand how you could listen to... This programme, for example, uh, whatever else you were listening to or reading, I don't really understand how you could do that and come away thinking this was indefensible. And you think, oh, it's just that insufferable lefty Ramona O'Brien. And then I go through the list of Conservative MPs possessed of exactly the same opinion as me, including some who were part of that red wall that was supposed to be Boris Johnson's sort of holy grail. So it, it's just gross. And it's really important. And I, I don't know whether it's professional of me or not to keep saying this, but I don't know what to do about it. 10.28 is the time. Ross is in Milton Keynes. Ross, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello. First time caller. Welcome. Hi, good to be on. Um, so what I'd like to say is, so I think Johnson is partly responsible. He sparked and provoked these people, this group. But like yourself, I've ran into this sort of mob, even ran into Piers Corbyn, Mm. Uh, just before Christmas, and Bad they weren't very nice to me. No, um, even threatening me a bit. Um, yes, not not him, but not him personally. I'm sure. Once you say names, uh, my little legal yeah. headlights come on, and I, and I have to just be slightly careful about. It. You're not accusing well, I, him of threatening you personally or anything like no, that. But some of some of the people, perhaps that that happened to be in, in appear to be in his company. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Piers Corbyn didn't. In fact, Piers Corbyn didn't actually say anything to me. He tried okay. to hand me a leaflet. I uh, challenged them. And he just isn't all there. Like, he, he was, like, looking through me. He yeah. just doesn't seem... It, it's just weird. So I think these people would be doing... That's what I mean, in a like, sense. That's what I mean when I say you have to turn your mind off, isn't it? Yeah. You have to sort of turn your uh, critical faculties off in order to keep thumping these drums. Yeah, no, definitely. Because the, the, the thing with this is all these pedophile conspiracies and that. There's a picture of Trump with Epstein. Yeah. But these people are on the same side as Trump. I, I, I don't think there's any reasoning with these people. And having spoken to these people and they were challenging me, you can't reason with them. But Well, once somebody says there's a satanic pedophile conspiracy going on and either you're part of it or you're ignorant of it, you, you, you there is, I've had that experience myself. Hey, what, what can you do? You know, it's a, you can't prove that there isn't because it would be like sort of proving that, 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 that I don't know, proving that the sky is blue to someone staring at the sky, insisting that it's purple. Yeah, it's a bit like having like rats in your house and like encouraging them by feeding them more. That's what Boris Johnson's doing. He isn't responsible largely for these people being here, but he's feeding them. Yeah, so that's like, a good point. You know, He's feeding he's them and he's enraging them. them and he's inciting them. And that, that is the crucial word here. And again, you know, the list of Tory MPs, many of you suggesting that 10 is a pitiful number. I would again, because I'm a very optimistic sort of chap, point out that it's a hell of a lot better than none. It's even better than nine. Uh, but also that Munira Mirza, the advisor widely regarded as being much closer to him, much more simpatico than Dominic Cummings ever was. I think Cummings and Johnson saw each other as means to an end, as, as vehicles for their own advancement. Munira Mirza very much the uh, uh, you know the power behind the throne we're told she walked the plank on this one the, the, this was the breaking point for her and and it's obvious why because even if I disagree with you violently about everything from Brexit to the redistribution of wealth to the to the uh, uh, statues of slavers pick a subject I disagree with you diametrically the one thing we'd agree on 
is that the Prime Minister can't tell barefaced lies about his opponent. Barefaced, divisive, dangerous and insightful lies about his opponent in the House of Commons. And the Leader of the Opposition can't tell barefaced, divisive and dangerous, insightful lies about the Prime Minister. In fact, no politician in the House of Commons should be able to do this. Unfortunately, you have quite a lot of Johnson's key supporters routinely engaging in lies and libel, either on Twitter, against people who can't be bothered to complain, or under parliamentary privilege, which means that even if people were minded to complain, there would be no redress. And where Johnson leads, these minnows follow. He rides roughshod over the frameworks of our society and the safeguards of our government, and then the, 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 the sort of quarter wits queuing up behind him feel empowered and even perhaps compelled to do exactly the same thing. At least Chris Philp this morning had the, I don't know, the conscience, sufficient conscience to actually sound ashamed and disgusted with himself as he swallowed furiously before subscribing to the Prime Minister's lies. 10.32 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. 10.36, and it, it makes page 13 of the mail, our earlier caller pointing out that the, um, the menacing, the harassment, the haranguing of the Leader of the Opposition, citing slogans that appear to have been plucked, fully formed from the Boris Johnson playbook. Uh, didn't make the front page of any of the more obviously right-wing leaning newspapers today. Um, does he bear personal... How much personal responsibility does Boris Johnson bear for this? I, I think you will struggle to, to answer none to that question, unless, of course, you're, you're, you're on the payroll or you're a fully paid-up member of Four Lock Tuggers R Us. And, and speaking of Four Lock Tuggers R Us, I thought, given the news about um, how much money BP has just posted in profit. Was it nine and a half billion pounds with massive energy bills on the way? I thought we'd just remind ourselves of, of that, um, the sort of three degrees of wrongness that consists of Jacob Rees-Mogg, Daniel Hannan, and I, I, you may not remember this fellow, in which case I apologise for reminding you of his existence, Douglas Carswell. A ridiculous report uh, from some lobby group yesterday saying price food will go up. It'll go down. Our food bills will be lower. Our energy costs would be lower. Our tax bills would be lower. Outside the EU, our food bills will be lower. Our fuel bills will be cheaper. Our taxes will be lower. I think people will be better off in terms of their household budget. The three degrees of wrong there, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Douglas Carswell and Daniel Hannan. One of them is now leader of the House. One of them is sitting in the House of Lords. And one of them, thankfully, I've got no idea what he's up to, but it, it's, it's fair to say that they haven't exactly suffered any consequences of being so catastrophically wrong about um, encouraging the United Kingdom to become the first economy in the history of humanity to impose economic sanctions upon itself. Back to their leader, their lord and master, although some of them uh, may turn upon him when it appears, or when it becomes clear that he can't deliver unicorns either, and the question of how much personal responsibility he bears. And I don't do this very often, but I told you I'm worried. I don't know what to do. I, I took the decision at first to not talk about this as much as I am doing now because it gives oxygen to the flames of Johnson's lies. And this is what I mean by the system not being equipped to cope with lies coming from that source in that space. You know, a president of the United States of America telling absolute barefaced lies from the Oval Office. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom telling absolute barefaced lies from the dispatch box in the House of Commons. We don't have, the media is not equipped to cope with it, especially a media that spent much of uh, the last decade becoming so completely tribal and entrenched that the, the, the right wing and the left wing of British politics, particularly at their extremities, look increasingly like circular firing squads. What do you do if you have been cheerleading for Boris Johnson for the last 10 years, never mind the last four or five. What do you do now that he's telling appalling, dangerous, insightful lies in the House of Commons? How hard is it to suddenly switch off? I've had callers that can do it. We've got MPs who are not necessarily coming down quite as strongly as you might hope or expect, but at least they're calling it out for what it is. And yet you've also got ministers, presumably in fear of losing their job in an imminent reshuffle, Selling their souls, selling little slices of their souls on live television. Roll up, roll up for a slice of Chris Philp's soul. How, how did you enjoy Quasi Quateng's soul on Sunday morning? Did you like that, madam? Well, guess what? I've got some of Chris Philp's soul for you today. Half the price of Quasi Quateng's. All right, yeah, I'll give you a refund on Nadine Dorries' that I sold you last week because, you know, uh, everybody's got some sort of modicum of taste. 
But that's what we're doing now. We're watching these ministers in support of Boris Johnson queue up on television to defend him and in so doing sell slices of their soul. And you think it's going to end badly for them? Or you think that it's going to have consequences or that the truth will out? And it will eventually, but it can take a hell of a lot longer than you think. Look at America, where the Republican Party now has officially endorsed the narrative that the armed attack upon the uh, seat of their government by an a, a, a violent mob baying for the blood of the vice president that was legitimate political discourse. That can only happen when big hitters or, or, or established politicians, people of whom you expected better, I don't know that anyone's ever said that about Donald Trump, join in with the lie. They respond to the, to the big dog whistle in the way that the big dog intended. Lawrence is in Birmingham. Lawrence, what do you think? James, firstly... Oh. Thank, thanks for being the voice of sanity. You well, know, we'll see. World of insanity. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I think, I think without, without your radio show, I, I really would just completely switch off. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to say to you that, that we're better than this. That mm. the morals of this country, of its leader, is being eroded by the day. I, I watched a film called The Riot Club. Oh yeah, which is about the early days of what ostensibly was called the Bullingdon Boys and still is in existence, which is Johnson's club at Oxford. Yes. And it showed the word for me, entitlement. Yes. These people who lead us now have been told that they, whatever they do, will remain in power. However corrupt, they will remain in power. They have the ability to do anything that they want without consequences. And enough is enough. Yesterday, Keir Starmer, we've had two politicians murdered. If one of the people in that gathering had a knife, they were so close to the leader of the Labour Party, it would have been an, a catastrophic disaster driven by what is a leading politician, our Prime Minister, standing up in Parliament and lying. Now, we do have rules, we do have archaic rules, but the Speaker has got to get control mm, of the House. I think the Speaker's got a lot of questions to answer. Oh, God, yes. And, and the people that sit behind this man, and I, I'm a lifelong Labour supporter, I will be honest and upfront. Sure. But there are good people in the Conservative Party. Yes. There are very good people in the Conservative Party. They've got to hold this man to account. He's got to be stopped from lying in Parliament and well, even what next? worse, what next? inciting violence. What next, Lawrence? That's the thing, isn't it? You sort of think, oh, he's lying. About... I keep drawing the parallels with America. He's lying about the election result. That won't last. That won't stick. No one will go along with that. And the next thing you know, the lies have, have, have incited a... A mob attacking the capital. What what happens? Well, well next? James, uh, uh, and I do honestly believe this, and it's drip, drip, drip. Mm. I do honestly believe this. He's going to survive. He's going to carry on as prime minister. But this country has to wake up. It has to realise that we need community. We need care. We need people who are in trouble to be looked after. Mm. I, I personally come from a very large family. I have eight sisters and four brothers. Gosh. I've been very, very lucky in life. Very, very lucky in life. I, I through luck and hard work, achieved yeah. a certain position in life that's, that's put me in a very, very comfortable position. I could pay, and I've said on many occasions to friends, more tax. There are a number of people in this country that are prepared to move back to a community-based situation, but it will not happen as long as we have the cronies with entitlements that lead the country, that believe they have no responsibility for anything they do or say, that they can act in a completely different way to the way they rule, and we keep forgetting what this man has done. Yes, I know He's led do. a party culture in number 10, whilst people were dying, who had funerals that nobody could attend, that they moved people back into care homes, James, we're better than this. Well, now, I think there is we are. Hang on. Look, what, what about... What, what, oh, yeah, go on. What's that, then? And I think it's at the next election. 
the next general I election. Tried before then. I'm not and quite I, as I pessimistic it, as you. I think I, 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 I don't think it'll be going anywhere right. before the May locals, but I, I think that could put a cat among the parliamentary pigeons. And, you, but, and of course, the other thing is, who knows what's going to come out next? You know, what about... I mean, we haven't even seen the Metropolitan Police report or even Sue Gray's report that they're all supposed to be waiting for before they decide whether the Prime Minister is a stand-up guy or not. You must have friends, or even with such a big family, family members, who are still under his spell... Lawrence, what do you... I mean, how do you account well, for that? James, this is the thing that staggers me. Yes. Um, I, 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 I'm not so much now, but I have a very close group of friends yes. that on a Saturday evening we, 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 we used to go regularly, but not so much now because of COVID, right. for a drink. And, and if I say that out of the group of friends, my position in life has changed relative to theirs. They're blue-collar workers. Yeah. Salt of the earth, yes. great people. Um, 60% of them are staunch conservative followers and I, and I judge what is happening in the country by those people because yeah, my friends they're have your focus group all, in a way aren't they they're yeah, your sort my of friends sample. have always 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 whatever he's done they've always supported him they were for brexit yeah the whole nine yards sure i've just started to see a crack a chink where now they're beginning to... And it's very hard for them, and I don't yeah. push them because the thing is not to push people. Good for you. And I've just started to see a chink where they're beginning to understand that they have been lied to, that this person is not the sort of person that should be running a country, but only just. Now, yeah. whether or not the Conservative Party are so hooked into being re-elected and don't believe without Johnson they can get re-elected and they keep him in power, I don't know. But the big onus now is not on the Conservative Party. I've just, I've given up all hope with the Conservative Party. Okay. If we re-elect this person, we will get the country we deserve. And if it wasn't for COVID, America... Yeah, I hear you. Well, you're not going to be surprised to hear that much of what you say, if not all of it chimes with me. Especially the bit, and I've been on a hard journey on that one, especially the bit about not pushing people and, and, and giving them time and space and even, even a safe space in which to change their minds. But, um, I, I mean, Trump would have been re-elected, I think, without the coronavirus, and I know that, that you'll be aware of that. And so any idea that things can get so absolutely awful that you, um, <laughs> that you, you, you know that, if you like, normality will be reimposed or that or the, 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 the lies will finally explode, I don't know that you can ever put a time limit on that. I don't know how long the worst of these administrations were have, have lasted in the past, but I, I know Lawrence is right when he talks about this being a new, a whole new level of lies, a whole new level of, of fundamental political, well, moral stroke political corruption, that willingness to deploy anything, to throw anything, it's a, it's a bit like a pub fight and someone turns up with Queensbury rules. There's a bloke over there that will nick, a, nick someone's wheelchair in order to hit their opponent over the head with it. That's, that, that's what we're looking at now. Keir Starmer's there with his Queensbury rules and his boxing gloves and his, his, his training and, and Boris Johnson's on the other side of the room throwing ashtrays and trying to nick crutches off disabled people so he can smack Keir Starmer over the head with them. Ah, at least that's how it looks to me. It's 10.48. You, I guess, in order to get your head around, if, if, if you really are, and I know that my inbox can sometimes be very unrepresentative of reality, but these people are real, some of them are real at least. If you're genuinely trying to sort of mount some sort of rearguard action on this, I've seen people claiming that, it's, it's, that it was a left-wing mob. I think the bloke that uploaded it to... YouTube, as far as I can tell, was a former Conservative councillor. But no, OK, you crack on. It's a left-wing mob. Um, the question then, it doesn't matter, does it? Again, you're doing the footballification thing. Because here's the question. Jimmy Savile died, what, over 10 years ago, I think? Prior to last Monday, when Boris Johnson told his lie in the House of Commons, how many times had Keir Starmer being abused and harangued in the street by people shouting about Jimmy Savile? That, that's the only question you need to answer. You can call him a left-wing mob if you want, but in answer to the... I mean, you're obviously crackers for doing that, but we live in hope. Simple question. If you're asking how much responsibility does Boris Johnson bear for what happened to Keir Starmer last night, here is the only question... Here is the question you need to answer first. How many times has Keir Starmer been abused in the street by an angry mob shouting about Jimmy Savile in the ten years since Jimmy, Jimmy Savile died prior to last Monday in the House of Commons, because the only places in which it's happened, as Keir Starmer himself has pointed out, are on the most fascist and the most toxic of 
websites and Facebook pages. Uh, that, that is the bottom line. It is a, a, a meme that was put out there by people who are you know, very much part of the, the um, QAnon world. And, and speaking of the far right... There is a far-right candidate in the French election. There's a couple, actually. And guess which world leader he described himself as being culturally and intellectually closest to. So this is uh, a, 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 a candidate who has built his campaign on anti-immigration and anti-Islam rhetoric. He's, I think, got into trouble. I'm sure he's been fined in the past for some of his comments. Who might he consider to be the other world leader to whom he feels culturally and intellectually closest. Shall I do that as a hook and tease? Far-right French candidate, anti-immigration, the usual spiel, out of all the world leaders, who would he feel most intellectually and culturally closest to? I'll tell you after the news. Uh, Ian is in Beverly. Ian, what would you like to say? It's tempting to answer your uh, question. Well, don't, don't, don't spoil it. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't spoil it for me. I won't spoil it. I won't spoil it. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, Great to speak to you, James. Likewise. And uh, just quickly mention that I really felt you on Saturday when Mud Lake was went in at Edinburgh. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Still not quite over it, but on no. we go. On we go. There, look, there looks to be a fine side, so I'm yes. sure I'm sure there's good times ahead. Um, yeah, right. yeah I'm, I'm particularly interested. I mean, the answer to your central question, of who, you know, is, is Johnson responsible? <laughs> Unequivocally, of course he is. It's the most sort of blatant of dog whistles. Um, and it's produced you know, not an unexpected mm. impact. But what particularly interests me, I, I've just recently retired as a lecturer in British and American politics. Okay. It's been a funny time to retire, really. There's so much oh, happening yeah. that I feel I, I read and follow the news more than I've ever done before. <laughs> but the point I particularly want to pick up on is that for us, I think, in the UK, it's not too late. I think in, in many respects, it, it's already gone in the USA. It, it, it's regarded now, I'm not sure if you've raised this issue before, but... America is widely regarded in political theory circles as no longer a democracy. It's labelled an anocracy. What does that uh, mean? Is, well, I mean, there's actually a, a kind of objective set of criteria by a group called Polity that, that assesses really whether a country, through the freedom of the openness of elections, right. the role of the legislature, uh, basically the use of truth and lies in, in, uh, in political life, whether a country can any longer be regarded as a democracy. Of course, the USA claims, probably quite rightly, I would say, until about 2000, and, oh, I would say probably uh, January 2017, if I was being specific, yes. when Trump was inaugurated. I think the USA could, could claim, quite rightly, to be the world's oldest democracy. Now, the polity don't regard them as, as that. They regard them as an anocracy. Switzerland has now become the oldest uh, democracy on their criteria. Really? Uh, That's I think fascinating. The term, is used, the term is a combination of authoritarianism and democracy. So you stick the A on front of, of democracy to stress that there are elements of representative democracy in an anocracy. Right, so which explains how Joe Biden could get elected, does it? Indeed, yes. so absolutely. There are elements of it, and there are bigger. El Russia, for example, is regarded as an anocracy of the most extreme form. Right, you but are. There are elements Got, yeah. of democracy even, even in. So there are gradations of anocracy. Absolutely then absolutely, so. I understand. And America has gone slid so far. And the thing I was listening when you were reading this morning, the list of conservative MPs who mm. come out and said that at least on the Savile incident, mm. the prime minister is wrong. He should withdraw. It's not. Let's face it, Johnson's apologies are fairly meaningless. It's the, the withdrawal that matters. No, I was mean, asking whether he should apologise is, is, yeah. is tabloid shallowness 101, I think. Yeah, he needs to withdraw the remarks of from in Parliament. That's yes. what he should be made to do. And I'd say the, 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 a previous column had a good point, I think, about the Speaker. You can see Lindsay Hall being torn at the moment. He knows he needs to intervene, but how? Mm. He's in a difficult position. The Conservatives have got a majority. It's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but the point I really would want to say is, I think with the American, with the Republican Party, it's gone. There are so few of them prepared to stand up against the terrible virus. I don't, I don't think they believe anymore. I you could list a litany of them. They don't no. believe in democracy because the numbers are against them. Yeah. They have to cheat, essentially, and they're cheating big style yeah. in gerrymandering the borders of election districts in restrict. We, at least, are not going down a voter restriction line. Or well, are we? Well, because ID cards. Exactly. Voter exactly. ID, you could make so the, that case. The alarm signals are very strong, but I don't think we're there yet. But what I would like to say is this 
this is the moment. This is a key moment. It might be our January the 6th moment, in a way. Johnson has to go. You cannot have, in a democracy, a leader who lies so compulsively. He just can't stop himself. It's just it's ludicrous. And, and it and does. You, I, the bit I struggle with, as I'm sure you do as well, is is that old Maya Angelou line about when someone tells you who they are, believe them the first time. None of this should really be shocking to anybody who's been paying attention. Very true. Very true. I think um, two of the cleverest men in the country, Matt Hastings and Simon Jenkins, wonderful writers. Everything they do is of the highest quality. Of course, they both had the misfortune to work with Boris Johnson, yeah. and both of them made it absolutely clear it would be a disaster. For our democracy, the first man became prime minister. Regardless of Brexit, regardless of party preference, it's nothing to do with that. It's to do with whether your system has got the integrity yeah, to expose someone and, who has no integrity. And the system can't cope with it because it is such an unprecedented level of whatever the opposite of integrity is. Ian, thank you. I look forward to talking to you again. I, I hope this can fill a small gap. Your contributions in the future of this programme can fill a small gap left in your life by retiring as a, as a, as a lecturer in British and American politics. That was my A-level, actually, was, was comparative politics, British and American. It's... Uh, I, I, do you know what? I've probably only relatively recently realised why <laughs> why they sit so comfortably. Why wasn't it English and French politics? Why wasn't it British and Swiss? Why wasn't it British and Greek? But British and American politics, of course, is, uh, is in many ways the foundation stone of the post-war period.